evening. Welcome to Ringing the Blues Live with me, Phil Catchpole, live from Wickham Sound. Arriving into your ears like a Joe Jacobson corner and with a fabulous array of special guests. We've got some fantastic stuff for you this evening. We have got the gaffer, Matt Bluefield. We have club director, Pete Kuhig. We have Wickham Wanderers chairman. I can see him in, with my very eyes from Louisiana wearing a shirt almost as nice as mine, Rob Kuhig as well. We're going to he hear from club legend, Keith Ryan. And at the end of the show, we're Wickham Wanderers. We do what we like. We will announce our change kit on the radio. Right, let's say hello to absolutely everybody. Good evening, Gaffer. Good evening, Pete. How are we doing? We're very well, thanks. Good, Cheers. Good. Cheers. Rob, by the miracle of technology, can you hear us? Me? Yes. yes. I'm, I'm intrigued by the announcement of our new kit via radio. This Look. is a technological feat I've never heard of, but I'm, I will stay for the end to see that. As you know, Rob, we like to do things a little bit differently at Wickham Wanderers, and we thought, what better way to introduce a new kit to our fans than on the radio? You can, of course, if you are listening to this thinking that sounds absolutely crazy, we are on the club's YouTube channel. You can stream it. We've also put all the images, and there's a fantastic video as well that will go out at 6.30 at the end of this show. Uh, but yeah, you can join us on YouTube. You can send in your questions via YouTube via media at www.fc.com. You can phone us on 01494 We're going to get through as many of your questions as we possibly can. But Pete, uh, and sorry, not Pete, Rob, I'm getting you confused already. I do apologise, Pete. Dude. Oh, mate, that's the look that Pete Cooks has given me is unbelievable. Uh, right, Rob, let's go. We're going to start with some questions for you. These have been sent in. Uh, question number one comes from Alex, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know the answer to this as well. Uh, what is the playing budget this year compared to last season, and what was the decision based on? Bill, I don't know if the massive technology gain has been lost here all of a sudden. Uh, if you can hear me, nod your head. But um, he, the, the playing budget, Matt, Matt and I probably, and Pete and I have three different views of it. I think it is significantly higher than last year. Matt will come in with facts and figures and prove to me I'm wrong. And Pete's trying to ride the rail between the two of us. But essentially, we'll be about where we were last year, and we are considering an upward deviation from it. One of the things we have to do is, is keep it within FFP regulations. Last year, because we were able to acquire uh, the 15% from the trust, when we did it, we, we went ahead and converted some of our loans to equity. That freed up some more space. Uh, I think that the budget will be sufficient to allow us to compete and compete very well at this league level. Uh, but we'll see as the next few weeks go along. Rob, since you did the first uh, Ring of the Blues live here in this very studio, the deal with the trust is all done and dusted. Now, how has that impacted that, uh, that answer as well? Well, I, I, to be fair, that's that was one of the major considerations. It allows us to invest more into the club. We're never going to be foolish. Um, Pete and Missy prevent that, and frankly, uh, financial reality prevents it. But it, it, it takes away, it gives us more freedom to do it, um, and, and it's been good. And, you know, truthfully, we just got the final things worked out uh, in the past couple of weeks. So it's, it's, it's taken longer than perhaps I wanted, but much, much better for the club, both in the short run and most importantly in the long term. Good stuff. Right, question number two. This comes from uh, Nick Coles. He says, Rob, you were on record as saying that we dug ourselves a hole last season and never really got out of it. And next year will be our best year. And he's talking about the season coming up. And he says, what have you and the team put in place to ensure that we aren't in a similar hole and that we match the ambition of it being our best year this coming season? Well, start with the fact I come from baseball. And in spring in baseball, every year is going to be your best year. Uh, in, in football, it's a little bit the same in the summer. I, I think that what happened to us last year, we didn't have as much control over as perhaps uh, I, I made, made it sound like. Remember, we started off with an onslaught of injuries, the likes of which I don't think the club's ever had to begin a season. And we didn't have our full-time goalie until 
three, four games into it. We've got uh, most of our positions covered at least uh, so that we can start the season on a solid footing. Uh, Pete's over there keeping an eye on the situation. Matt, I have been tremendously impressed with his acumen and drive to get us ready. So, yeah, I think this season's going to be our best. It's up to me and it's up to the rest of us to do our part to make sure we go. I, let, me, let me take one second, too, though, Phil, to add something. Part of life is learning and educating oneself. I, I probably early days misunderstood the whole big club, small club concept. But when we're talking about, and we're gonna have our most successful season ticket push since we've been with the club this year, both uh, one-time buys and subscriptions, the radio and TV package is going great. But then you compare and contrast it to a Derby who in five games will generate as much money from those five home games as we're likely to do in the course of our season. It gives them much greater leeway to go out and, and not just get more players, but to make some mistakes. One of the pressures that I know Matt feels, that, that Pete feels, I feel, is we don't have much room for error. That's why I'm so happy with the group we've put together. I think we can compete. I think we will be better than we've been ever before, but but we have precious little room for mistakes. And and you can't make up for it just by adding numbers to it. You gotta add the right people. And that's why I like Matt's sort of two two tiered test. Are they good people and are they good players who work with us? And I think that combination is gonna serve as well. Okay, and uh, this is a, another question that's uh, also from Nick Coles, but we've also had quite a Where'd few you go? Uh, on these other <laughs> ones. Can you still hear me, Rob? Yeah, I can. Okay, yeah, so this is also from Nick, but we've also had a few similar questions. Uh, uh, and Nick was also saying um, regarding the prices in the club shop being too expensive. He set an example of a, of a, of a coat being £106, uh, although on the O'Neill's website it was a, a great deal cheaper, but this one had a Wickham badge on it. Um, but I think broadening it out, um, we've had a few messages as well about the club shop being too expensive. We've got a new kit supplier this season. Uh, do you stand by the pricing strategy of last season? And can fans expect any change in that area? Uh, I don't think they can expect any change. Let me put it in perspective. Go back to what I was just talking about with Darby. I think our fans, like fans everywhere in the world, would like everything cheaper, but they would like us to spend more. We're not going to do both of those things at the same time because that's an alchemy that does not exist in the real world. What we do in our club shop is a, we follow a, a relatively simple retailing formula. We take the cost that it cost us and we add a small amount to it to pay for our overhead and to pay for part of Matt's uh, sins. And off we go. And, and it's nothing brutal. It is a fact of life. Uh, I don't think our prices are that different than most places. We certainly don't have an aggressive upgrading of the prices. In fact, we try and, and lower them um, where we can. So. It is what it is, as they say. The good news is um, there are always going to people be people. And this is the thing I've learned. It matters little what you do. There are going to be three or four people who are going to get on and whine about whatever it is you do. You know, we, we've managed to secure a, a pregame special between Chelsea and Arsenal. And people are going to come on and whine and say, how come you didn't bring in Liverpool against Manchester United as the pregame? Uh, so we, we listen to them, we try and register those complaints and where possible we deal with them. On the price, on pricing, we want a competitive football team that's going to strive to be at the top. Some of that means that our fans have to pay more perhaps than they want to, but that's the only answer. Um, Rob, the match day experience as well. When I remember when you guys first arrived at Wickham Wanderers, that was always a big at the top of the priority. New caterers coming in uh, and chips as well at, in the Frank Adams and the Kiosk, which is big news. Announced chips, I think, was a, was a big uh, trending topic at one point about a year ago. You've announced them. but So we're expecting good things from Baxter Story, our new catering partner. Yeah, it is. And, and look, we went uh, and look, I loved Will. Will Shaw did a tremendous job for us. But this is another step towards bringing in and sort of institutionalizing something that can be better for us. 
the chips are a funny example. The day the chips were announced, somebody uh, sent me a note of somebody else criticizing the announcement because it didn't say in every single kiosk they would be available. Uh, you, some people you can't win with, but yeah, chips, we'll eat them. Uh, we're ready to go. Uh, fans who are coming to the uh, to the fan event uh, on Saturday will get their first chance to experience the work of, of Baxter Story as well and get to meet the, the squad and have a good look around Adams Park as well. Uh, on that topic, Simon Hallis has contacted us saying, when not accepting my refund during COVID, uh, you promised a Mardi Gras type party and food for those that didn't take up the refund. Some season ticket holders have waived refunds well into the thousands. Saturday's party isn't really that. What's happened? That's from Simon Hallis. I think reality has set in a little bit. Let me tell you what we've done. Uh, we People forget we gave them the Leicester game for free. We have made sure that they are, are getting all kinds of other benefits that we didn't make the announcement. We were delayed in even having a party. We wanted to do it. Matt and his group have been kind enough to join us in a sort of unique event where the, the, the manager and, and his staff and some of the players will be there to talk. They'll get an inside look at the stadium. Who knows, we may even pop for a beer or two before it's all over. But what we're trying to do, Phil, is the best we can fulfill it. And we will never forget those people who stood by us. That's why we constantly without advertisement, try and find little ways to thank them. And so is it not a Mardi Gras party? Probably not, um, but but we're doing what we can. Rob, thank you very much. Uh, we'll just change the tone as, as a bit here because Dan Clark has got the now traditional question, uh, which will now go to Pete. Uh, would you rather fight, fight a bear-sized duck or 10 duck-sized bears? Brief answer, please. <laughs> uh, <laughs> seeing this one on the... Uh... Is that a, you do a little bit with yeah. the players? On yeah, that, yeah. Right? This, this, right, is, so this is, is from it? Dan Clark. This is a fan question. I stress. If anyone is, is out there who feels this is a bit irrelevant, but this is a this is a feature. Come on, what is yeah. it, Pete? Yeah. Well, a Pete, yeah, a bear Pete should know I'm bear, And let me tell you this: it's because uh, one of the reasons I hunt, I, and I hunt ducks. I love hunting ducks, <laughs> and it's because I love cooking ducks. And so they also got kind of a weak neck, and so I think I could get them crack his neck, kill him, and then I'd love to roast a bear-sized duck. Ooh, that would taste good. There you go. This is drive time. People going on their way home for dinner and they'd love that answer. <laughs> the great thing about this question, Dan, is, is that we get a full range of answers. That is, is quite a unique one, as we'd have come to expect from Peter Kuhig. Right, we'll be back after these and we'll be talking to the gaffer. Online, on Radio Player. At Welcome back to Ringing the Blues Live, live on Wickham Sound on their drive time show. 
Rob Kuhig, we've heard from, we've heard from Pete Kuhig. Let's hear it from the gaffer, Matt Bloomfield. We've got a question coming in here, Matt, from, uh, from Marcus. He says, one for the gaffer here. You've talked about wanting to put your own stamp on the team's style of play. How would you summarise this? And how does it differ to the previous style of play? Yeah, I think we have um, spoken about stamping our own style of that. And I think it's one style of play and it's two in everything we do. I think um, I've got to be really careful not to try and um, mimic or copy anything that's been before me, but I'm also not going to try and be too clever and move too far away from it. We know what we are as a football club, and we know what's worked for us in the past, and we will certainly be trying to use that as a as a base for moving forward. But I think the, what I'm trying to speak speak about is just adding little bits around it as of what reflects us of what we're trying to do as a coaching staff. So there'll certainly be some some differences. There will certainly be some slight nuances and changes, but we're not going to try and reinvent the wheel. Um, we can wonder as has been um, known for um, our up. Up, up and at them style, um, using uh, forward options when we can. So, yeah, we're certainly not going to be trying to change too much, but um, I hope people will see that we are trying to add our own stamp on things as well. And up at the training ground, there's been changes as well. There's been, you know, fresh lick of paint. Uh, great thanks to the volunteers as well. A switch round in some of the office room and obviously some new backroom staff as well after Dave Waits departing, uh, uh, people coming in, new faces, new energy about the place too. Yeah, most certainly so. You know, we've spoken a lot. You know, there was such a, a long tenure before me uh, in such a successful spell. I felt it was quite important to put my own stamp on things at the training ground as well, give it a little bit of a fresh start. So I've moved offices. We've got some new staff in. Obviously, Dave has gone to join the gaffer down at, at QPR. Dobbo's left as well. So I think there is a, a little bit of a freshness about it. Um, there's going to be some new faces, new players coming in as well. Um, so what we're trying to do is is trying to be as intelligent as we can to align the old with the new and make sure we have a fresh fresh new chapter for Wickham Wanderers, which is what we're obviously really excited about. Uh, the new signing that we've, we've announced so far in the window, uh, Richard Keogh, 36, a guy you know well from, from your time back at Ipswich all that time ago, and Wickham had a, a loan spell with him 18 years ago. Uh, is that bringing in... Uh, a bit of a leader, a leader in there as well, as well as the experience. Can I please, yeah? Can I just first acknowledge? I, I see the irony in talking about a fresh new start and signing uh, a 36-year-old <laughs> who's been here before. So that's certainly not lost on me. Um, what what Kesey certainly brings is a leadership, a know-how, um, a, a voice. Um, he can. He's obviously played a lot of games at a high level. His quality on the ball, the way we're trying to do things, and the way he demands from other people, his intensity around the building, I thought was too good an opportunity to, to miss. Um, so whilst I acknowledge the irony, I think it's a, a top signing for us. He's not here as a cheerleader. He's not here just to a, a be a voice. He's here to play as well. And I'm, I'm certainly, you know, certainly delighted to have him in the building and, and with us at Wickham. Uh, Adam El Abd signed in League Two this season. Wickham got promoted. Darius Charles, I think, was the first signing of the window that we came out of League One into the Championship. And of course, Richard got out of the Championship with Ipswich last season. So along with that experience, there's that knowledge of getting across the line. He knows what it, what it takes. Um, to win, he knows what it takes to run a, a proper uh, environment. He knows what it takes to to perform at an elite level, international football, championship football. He knows what it's all about, and he's still got plenty of football in his legs. He's got a huge desire um, to come and do it with us at Wickham. I've known him a number of years. He's been here before, and I think that that certainly adds, you know, what we've spoken about, adding the old with the new. Um, we've had plenty of players over the years that returned to the club and had great times, and we th we certainly think that Richard can be one of them. Uh, being up, up and around the training ground a fair bit this last few weeks, lots of people on phones pacing around. That's kind of, <laughs> if I could put the window in a nutshell of a, of a meme, that would be it. I mean, it, there's so much work going in, isn't there, to getting people in? Yeah, I've, uh, I've been on the phone uh, on the beach in Croatia. I've been on the phone uh, walking along the seafront in Felix. I've been on the phone at home in the car at the training ground. There's lots of work going in, um, but, you know, things that are worthwhile are not easy, so we have to make sure we work hard for it, and we'll certainly do that and make sure we get the right uh, people in the building. Uh, Pete, this is uh, what window is this for you now? In, in terms it's of fourth summer, yeah. So yeah. Uh, wasn't was really more on the business side the first first summer. Uh, got active immediately in that January window with Gareth, and have uh, been working on that side of the business ever since. Uh, our job, my job, is really to help facilitate what the manager wants and wants to get done, and um, it takes all hands on deck. You know, it's not as easy as the. Uh, football manager game you know you can't press a <laughs> few buttons and get decisions it is uh especially with free agents especially with loans there is a very complicated process um behind getting those guys to say yes it it doesn't happen uh it does not happen overnight and it's it's something you have to work on constantly um came over early uh to to work with matt talk about the budget talk about everything do uh 
do need to clarify something. Uh, Rob gets a little excited on the uh, on on the radio, you know, and uh, as everybody's aware from last year. But this year, uh, Matt and I were happy to know that we have the same budget as last year. We've been operating under the, you know, <laughs> under a smaller budget. Uh, you know, and in I, fairness, there was a little translation <laughs> error there. <laughs> 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 but no, uh, you know, we are, uh, and it's from, you know, the, we, we had a game plan. Uh, the first year in the championship, we thought we could stay up possibly with what we had spent. We came really close, and it was so we could have, you know, some more ammo for, for next year uh, and give it a really good go if we were in League One. We did that. We really loved the team, so we really committed to a second very well-funded Wickham Wanderers team, you know. Uh, we had a pretty substantial shortfall last year that we had to cover. We have a pretty substantial shortfall that we have to cover forecasted for this year. So it is, it is critical for us to bring the right guys in, to get the right kind of deals done that we can afford. Uh, Wickham can't pay the same kind of wages that an, that an Ipswich can, that a Sheffield Wednesday can, that those teams that, you know, flew through the league last year. We do think uh, with the way that who came down, who came up, that League One is a uh, – League One last year was an unbelievably tough league. And i got to be honest, at the beginning of the year, I thought with what we had put together, I agreed with Rob that we were – I would have worded it a little differently. I thought we were in it for the automatics. And I think when you look at where we dropped points last year, how we dropped them, you know, we really weren't that far off. Uh, couple of early game goals in, in some of those games, and it would have been three points instead of zero. Um, so going into this year, uh, Matt had a great spring that he was able to really get to know the players from a management perspective, from a manager perspective. Uh, we could figure out, and we slowly did over the spring, over, you know, we worked extensions for some of the guys. We knew who our core was going to be, and Matt went to work putting a, a staff together that – and brought in Scott, brought in, you know, another uh, another analyst, uh, and uh, now we got three Bens <laughs> <laughs> on the staff. But it's uh, you know it's 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 a very complicated process because you really have to look at the existing depth chart that you have going into next year. You have to look at where you want to add, and then you have to produce lists of of players, and then just start working through them. And Man, uh, I have been really impressed watching Matt in the recruitment process when these players come in and how he uh, discusses, how he explains what the opportunity to Wickham is. And it's, I, and it's at every level. You know, we've, uh, Sam is going through the same process with the trialists right now. You know, we're already on, we're, we're on our first week of full trials. There's 20, guys, 20 kids out there. And so it's really a, a, the model that we've built over the last few years, you know, kind of expected some hiccups probably sh shifting from manager to manager. But I think we're very lucky in the fact that Matt had been involved in the process last year, um, was very involved in the process at, at Cole over the, over the January window. And um, these guys have come in flying, you know. I've been very impressed with uh, the information that they put together on our targets. Um, you know, uh, clever new one of the new Ben's clever Ben is really putting together some uh, very uh, the visualization of modeling is is extremely impressive because these are investments that we're making. You know, we uh, you know we're bringing a guy in like Richard Keogh. The investment isn't just uh, there's no possible possibility to sell him, so it's different than bringing in an 18 and 19, 20 year old. Whereas Richard, he can still play. But what he's also done, and why he why Ipswich wanted to keep him around, was he's very good bringing along younger younger players and coaching, being a coach on the field like Matt was, like JJ is, like and so marrying up with with what Wickham has done historically very well, which is find jewels of players a little bit late in their career, with what we're trying to do on the development squad has really helped us do what we need to do, which is monetize those guys, you know? And it's came along because, you know, Gareth McCleary took him under his wing and really told him what it was gonna take and the other guys in the, in, in the building. And so, and they're doing the same thing with, with Farina, with Jasper, with all of those guys. And, and those guys are ready to play. So Matt, I think it, 
during the window, everyone gets, especially fans, get super excited about seeing the gift and the players coming in. But I think what Pete's trying to say here as well, and I think Jurgen Klopp has said this, you know, the best sort of strategy is to develop and coach and improve the players in the building as well. Like, you know, people are saying, using the experience of the older ones and bringing the, and the younger ones through. Yeah, most certainly so. We don't want to um, keep looking out the window at what could be a shiny new uh, player that we all are getting excited about. If we've got ones in the building, we need to make sure that we're as fair to the boys that are already here as we are to the ones that we're trying to bring in. I think what's, what's vital to add is that we will not sign anybody that we don't believe is 100% ready to play for us and improve us. Um, I don't want to bring players in the squad just to add numbers and get excited that we're going to bring new players in. Everyone that I sign, I, I believe, is going to improve us and help us move forward. So. Um, I think that's really important to add that, um, you know, one of the things I learned from, from the gaffer before is that, you know, he, he was really good at picking off good deals late in the window. And if you have to do that, then you have to do that. Um, I listened to the podcast High Performance and the Professor Damien Hughes says success leaves clues, right? So what, what clues can I pick up from the gaffer here before and what do I want to make sure I take with myself and, and what am I going to add around it? Uh, do you understand where the fans come from where, you know, we're in the, in the summer season, there's no games. They're, they're furiously looking at their phone, seeing other teams maybe doing business early on. Do you understand their frustration at times? Oh, absolutely so. I remember being a kid at, uh, looking at the uh, the local newspaper when there was before internet at Ipswich, waiting for the summer signings to drop and getting also frustrated. Like, I understand it, and and I've been just as frustrated at times because I want I want the signings to come early. But um, what I bo want above and beyond that is to make sure that they're the right signings. And if they come in May, great. If they come in June, great. If they come in the first or second week of July, then that's also fine. It's is making sure they're the right players for this football club because we care about the club. And we want to make sure that the right people are involved in it. And with the head of recruitment with Scott Mitchell, is this you know we're in a window at the moment, but uh, is is, a, is there is that model with a, he's looking maybe two three windows ahead as well? Once we get through this window, he will. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> at the moment it's all hands to the pump. Uh, me and him are on the phone uh, last thing at night and first thing in the morning. I'm on the phone to Pete last thing at night, first thing in the morning. It doesn't. It literally doesn't stop. Um, but it's obviously a role that I believe in. Um, I want to plan a window ahead, two windows ahead, possibly even three. We have to look at whose contract's expiring, what does the, you know, what is the strength and weakness analysis of that looks like, what's the threats, who do we have in the building who might get bought, can we make sure we've got plans around it. So I, I think that his role is, is really vital to complement what me and Pete already do. Um, he's certainly not coming in to take over. He's supplementing what we already have and the contacts uh, that he has and, and, and the knowledge that he has will just supplement what we already have in the building. A uh, question here from Will Henley. He says, firstly, good luck for the season. Says we're back in blooms and the lads all the way. Good lad, Will. Uh, can't wait for the season as well, he adds. He says, have you found slash seen any gems in the reserve <coughs> under 23 setups of higher league clubs that are waiting for a chance to play men's football? I think he's alluding to the loan market there. Yeah, quite possibly. Um, yeah, we, we, we think we're close to a couple of um, really good loans. We're really excited. Um, don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves because we want to make sure they're in the building first, but well, we believe we're really, really close. Um, so I certainly believe that um, you know ha exploiting that market, using that market cleverly um, is something we can do. Um, it helps with the budget. It helps with the energy levels inside the building. These young lads up and looking forward to, to big careers ahead. It also helps our older boys to, to pass on some knowledge. As a football club, I think we've been, over the years, we've really found a fulfilment with helping younger lads fulfil their ability and go on to bigger careers. And, and we've seen some really good players pass through the building. So um, if we can utilise that to the best effect we possibly can, then, then we'll certainly try and do that as well. With a loan, is it more complicated because it's not just a player and an agent, you've also then got the parent club as well to look after. Uh, so there's another sort of factor in there as well. Does that add more barriers, more obstacles to getting a deal done? Yeah, there's, there's players, there's agents, there's parents, there's, there's parent clubs who, you know, Premier League clubs start a week or two later than we do because their season starts later. So you're waiting for them to return to their clubs for, for testing and all the rest of it. So you have to um, be really respectful of, of what they have to do at their own, own club first. So I think that's probably delayed a couple of bits, but you know, none, no deal is straightforward, um, loan or permanent, and so you have to negotiate all the different factors. There's so much that needs to drop for something to happen, and, and like I say, there's loads of people to keep happy along the way, and we, we believe that we're getting a bit closer. I guess it didn't hurt that Eberich Yeze in his, in his press conference for England before he made his debut and after he made his England debut uh, said his loan spell at, uh, at Wickham Wanderers was, was quite formative in his career. Most certainly so, and, and Pete alluded to it earlier on. We, we go really in depth, you know, it's not just about the player that you see in, in, in the PL2 or, or whatever level they're playing at, it's about 
Can we get um, character references from previous coaches? Can we see what they're like around the training ground? Can we find out about their hunger levels? What level do they want to go and play at? So there's plenty to do. Uh, it's not just one phone call and they're in. You have to make so many phone calls to, to get to a resolution, but it's worth the hard work because we really believe that uh, we hopefully will, will get some soon. No, that's also it, it, what we do with those lone players like Chim. Last year's a perfect example. We have to pick the right player to come in because the worst thing we could do is bring a player in that doesn't end up playing. And so when we, when we bring a player like Chim in last year and he incorporates into the squad immediately uh, and really shows some great progression, every loan that we bring in like that is a selling point for that, in, that club again. But also other clubs look at, what, at, how, at, at how you treat loan players from every other club when they're making that decision. So it's pretty important for us to get those, it, not just get them in in numbers, it's get the right ones in so that we can, so that they, they learn from the experience as well and help us at the same time we help them. A uh, question here from uh, Nigel Rowling says, Hi Matt, last term, I think season, yeah, season last season, we saw uh, glimpses of a different style of play from the team in a number of games. Uh, how would you describe the style of football we can expect from the team uh, this season? And are all the pieces in place yet to make it happen? No, all the pieces are not in place yet. Um, we're certainly looking to add more, um, most certainly so. We want to make sure we've got more players in the building by the time the season starts, and I, I believe we will. Um, there is obviously going to be differences with any management team, with any style of play. There's going to be differences. I'm not, like I said earlier on, I'm not looking to take it too far away from where we've been over the years, but we will be looking to, to add our own little stamp on things. I think that it was always going to be a, a perception that people would want to make about differing style of plays from, from old manager and new. Um, and whilst I try not to get too caught up in that, I want to make sure that I get... Uh, what I see my job is trying to get the best out of the players that we have in the building and trying to supplement that with the right style of play. It's not about me trying to be um, clever or trying to replicate or trying to do anything else. It's about what strengths do we have in the building and what formation fits those players the best, who can we recruit around that and, and sending out a team that we believe can go and win football matches. Uh, Oliver Knoll has been in contact here. Says, uh, Matt, from your long spell at being at Wickham Wanderers, what have you learned from the previous teams, of which there have been many, haven't there, and managers as well in your time, uh, to what makes a successful squad? What have you taken from various different teams at Wickham? I think the number you have in your squad is, is vital. Um, too little, you leave yourself open to, to injuries. Too many, you have too many unhappy players, and that causes just as many problems as having too little. So I think the numbers you have in your squad, we've gone back and done the research over the, the previous management, what number was the optimum level, which is what we're aiming for. Um, and I think using you know, subjective and objective information is really important. So what, what, what do I feel like is working, but also what are the facts telling me? Um, we've gone over successful seasons, how many numbers within the squad, what's the balance of the squad, the age makeup, all the rest of it. So um, that's one thing that I've learned going for, over those facts. Um, and that's sometimes that I know uh, the gaffer before me was happy with the size of his squad and other times was unhappy because he had too many players, just as, many as, just as much as too few. So getting the numbers right is really, really important, uh, but obviously getting the quality right is, is just as important. I mean, this, it's almost covered off really that answer, but Chris Lazaru has said, you know, with the lack of squad depth last season proving costly at vital moments, is this something you were looking to address in the summer? Uh, or is the plan to have a small squad uh, like we've had as well uh, in previous years that's, that's been successful? And how many recruits can we realistically see coming in this summer? Uh, and uh, and he said, have we missed on targets so far? So it's quite a few questions there, but I don't I don't think like a lot of people understand how squad depth that's a rule. So we can only have 22 players over the age of 21, mm. and so the first depth limitation is really that it's the actual rules, and so and especially at a club like ours where we only have a dev squad. Uh, you know, it's a little bit more difficult to add the kind of depth that some of these teams have that can sign unlimited numbers of players. I think something else to, to add is it's been part of our consideration. If we, you know, you can only have so many players, so can we have some players that can do different positions that allows you to change formation within games or from game to game? So Pete's exactly right. There's limitations on the squad, but also, you know, a lot of our thought process is what formation are we going to play, How what players can play in different formations and how can we balance it out the best we possibly can. 
um, with all of this as well, I mean, the chairman alluded to this at the start of the show, you do always need that bit of luck across the season as well, because if you do get struck down by vital injuries in, in certain either players or groups of players, that's going to hurt any team, isn't it? I think any team uh, <laughs> throughout the Football League and the Premier League will have certain players, because if they get injured, then, then it affects the squad more than other, other players. I think that's just a fact of life. Some people you know, have more effect on games and results and, uh, than others, um, but doesn't mean that, that you can't, you try and mitigate the circumstances, but sometimes it happens. So you have to have a little bit of luck along the way and you have to try and do the best you can with your training schedule, with your, with your weights, with your fitness, with your everything, make the players as robust as you can. We're, we're changing the schedule slightly this year as well to try and add something different to the schedule they've done before. That's not saying we were right and it was wrong. It was just trying to change a couple of subtle bits just to see if we can add a slight freshness and, uh, and moving us forward as much as we can. A few weeks into pre-season now, have you noticed the difference in the players coming back having had a proper break? Because we haven't had that at Wickham Wanderers for a little while. Yeah, most certainly so. I feel like they've really come in with a bounce in their step. I really feel like the boys have come in with a bit of a freshness and Again, you know, we've, we've talked about a lot about uh, the change and, and bits and pieces, but one thing it does do is give the lads a little bit of an intrigue. Um, you know, Tomo's, uh, my assistant Richard, is, is, is an elite coach. I think he's one of the best I've ever seen working on the grass. I think he's absolutely top. Um, some of the sessions he puts on, the only anger I have is that I'm not young enough to join in with some of them to, to join in with the lads. They're really, really good. So um, we're very lucky to have him. We work really well together. And I think that, you know, uh, the lads have, have really enjoyed pre-season so far. Uh, one for both you and Pete here. This is from Tom Hutchings. Hey, it says, how does our partnership with non-league gems work with regards to recruitment? And is this avenue one we should start to explore further? Well, we certainly do, yeah. Uh, Gracie's really close with the guys from, from non-league gems. He's actually coming to the training ground at the end of the week to come and visit us. Um, I think you've seen with Christy Ward, with Justin Pattenden, with, with Luca Woodhouse, I believe, as well. Um, obviously, with Chris coming out of university, where we got him from Loughborough as well, um, we, don't, we, we try not to leave any stone unturned. Um, Gracie's really thorough in his recruitment process, and I think the, the players we've got, obviously, Anis was playing um, step seven, I believe, or something, when we got him from Woodford Town. So... I, th I would say actually that's one of the parts that, that Grace is really, really in depth with and, and tries to stay on the front foot as much as he can. Pete, I mean, Chris Farino, Anis Fumetti, uh, the model's there, isn't it? The, the pathway's there as well for players that are already in the building, but already ones that are coming through. Yeah, we, uh, you know, early on we, we knew um, that we weren't going to be able to, you know, you can help the revenues on the commercial side, but at a League One level with the kind of attendances that happen at Adams Park, the, the amount of merch that we sell, the only way to truly become a sustainable League One operation is through player trading. And so it was one of the reasons why we started the development squad that second year. Um, it was, the, you know, we, not, not even the second year, I started working on it with Gareth and the guys um, late fall. And then early spring, we started really doing some research as to who we should bring in. And we really found the absolute perfect guy because um, not only does Sam know everybody in the youth market, he loves going to games, he loves watching video, he, lo he reviews everything and has, has set up a really good process. We bring, you can't imagine how much stuff he has to look at on the forefront um, from players, from agents, from everywhere. And so he's got a really good process to be able to flow through the hundreds, if not thousands of recommendations to the 50, 60, 70 trialists that we bring on um, during the summer of which we might take five or six or seven. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's created the early results, you know. Um, I mean, monetarily it's done, done well. But also, uh, we've, cr we've created three internationals out of our development squad. You know, TJ gets, gets caps for Gibraltar. Anis has now been capped for Albania. Uh, went home uh, on, a, on a soccer trip with my kids, and we just turned on the TV, and all of a sudden there's St. Kitts, and it's freaking Andre Burley playing <laughs> in the Gold Cup. I was like, hey, guys, that's all. <laughs> and uh, Chris Farino is, is about to get... Uh, as soon as he can get the paperwork done with Saint, San Lucia, he is going to play for them as well. So we are not only creating players and income for Wickham Wanderers, but we're adding some names onto the wall. Uh, you know, the development squad, so that's three, going to be four. How many internationals has Wickham Wanderers produced over the previous 140 years? I think 10 or 11 before yeah. that. So, yeah, yeah. so we're doing well.
There we are. Right, we're going to have a break now, and we'll be back with Pete and uh, Matt Bloomfield here as well. We may even hear from Rob, who's waiting very patiently uh, on the other line as well in Louisiana. But we'll be back after these. Back to Ringing the Blues, live on Wickham Sound from the heart of the chair metropolis and some Ringing the Blues news for you as well. Uh, the podcast is going live for the whole season. Tuesday, 7 till 8, it's going to be a live show. It will also get uploaded into Spotify, Apple and wherever you get your podcast as normal as well. But we're going to keep this live energy throughout the season. Live guests and the ability for you guys to phone in, join in the conversations as well. We'll have the usual features plus loads more as well. So there's some breaking news on the podcast. So yeah, stay tuned. And I know Tuesday night is our midweek game, so it'll be live before games going straight into commentary. We're also going to bring you live commentary of our pre-season schedule as well, which includes a game that's behind closed doors at the training ground. And that will be able to be listened to on Wickham Sound 106.6 FM in High Wickham. And also, as it's out of the EFL regulations, you can listen online. So if you're somewhere exotic like Slough or Barbados, you can also listen in and listen to our pre-season friendlies. Uh, so that's a bit different for this season as well. Right, on with the questions, because we've got some great guests this evening. Wickham Wanderers manager, Matt Bloomfield, director, Pete Kewig. Rob is still there as well. We'll bring Rob in before the end of the show as well. And let's not forget... We're releasing the new change kit on the radio as well at some point before the end of the show. So stay tuned for that. And you can join us on the YouTube channel so you can even see the shirt as well. And it will also go out on the club channels at the end uh, of this show too, so you can see it in all its glory. Uh, Matt, we've got a text in here. Another one for the gaffer. You mentioned you listened to the High Performance Podcast. Uh, it's a very good podcast, by the way. It says, what's your definition of high performance? Fantastic. Um, just trying to be better every day. I think being the best you possibly can be. Um, I think that there's so variation, so much variation to results um, that you have to judge yourself on what you do every moment of every day. And that's what I believe high performance is. The way you, you treat others around you, the way you approach your work, the way you try and um, be the best you can be. Um, and I just, that's my, my definition. Of it. I have thought of this a lot on the A12 and the M25. I was going to say, you must, get, you, you must listen to a lot of podcasts because you spend a lot of time in the car. I do, yeah, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, I also only recruit staff that live on the A12 or the M25. <laughs> I pick them all up on the way in. So first pick up is Ben Cerny at quarter to five in the morning uh, from Ipswich. And then we go and meet Harry on the way and Tomo. So, uh, yeah, we, we do a lot of our best team meetings or, or staff meetings in the car on the M25, I think. Is your club, club car the, the, the team coach? Yeah, they all jump in the back. <laughs> boots in the, all the bags in the boot. We all jump in. And it's, it's actually really valuable time because it means we can still be working when we're, we're traveling. Um, so... Yeah, my, a lot of people think we're crazy, but um, we actually really enjoy it. And we, we get to talk about football all day long. I read and listen to a lot of this stuff as well. And, and something I've seen coming up quite a bit in the last sort of year, 18 months, is the phrase growth mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean? It means exactly that, trying to take yourself out of your comfort zone. It's one of the reasons that I know Rob and Pete were extremely keen for me to go to, to Colchester last year, get you out of your comfort zone and go and try something different. Um, I've been speaking to a young player about my, my journey to, to Wickham when I was 19. 
Um, going and standing on two feet and being independent. And a growth mindset for me is questioning yourself every moment of every day. Are you doing right? And is there anything more you can do? Um, and that's exactly what you need to be. If, you, if you're closed mindset, if you're just closed off to the world, then you're never going to get any better. And I, like I say, definition of high, high performance is to try and get better every moment. Uh, Jaden Wilkins has uh, got in contact and says, I just wanted to start off by saying I'm delighted to have Matt back as Wickham manager. I'm very excited for the season and have purchased my first ever season ticket. Good lad, Jaden. Every week. He says, my question to Matt is, having worked under Gareth and Dobbo, how much inspiration have you taken from the way that they approach the job? And have you put your own spin on things that they did as well as implementing your own beliefs? So we've kind of covered a little bit already, but what did you gain from sort of Gareth and Dobbo? Yeah, uh, the culture. Uh, the culture of Wickham Wanderers has to remain true to who we are and what we stand for. It's, I've spoken to a lot of people about this over the summer, and um, it's almost like when I talk about change and we talk about freshness, it's about uh, rediscovering who we are and making sure we're better at who we are and what we are. Um, and that's one of the things I believe in wholly. I think my my time at the football club um, gives me a deep uh, belief and, and love and affection for the place. So there'll be no penny spent unless we absolutely have to. There'll be no um, there'll be no shortcuts. It's about trying to be the best we can be. And, and the culture that we had under the Gaffer and Dobbo under a number of years, um, I believe that I can continue it and add a new spin on it as well. So that's what I've learned from them, and I I look forward to continuing their legacy in, into my own tenure. Uh, there is a message that you've got to read out as yeah, well. Yeah, I've been meaning to do this. Apologies. Yeah, I just want to wish Mike Tyler a happy belated 60th birthday for Monday. And um, we look forward to seeing you at Adams Park during the season. So, hope you had a great day on Monday. And uh, yeah, thanks for your support, Mike. Uh, another message that's come in from uh, on, on the WhatsApp as well. It says, I know that you've been pretty busy, Matt, since you've come back to Wickham. But could you please reply to my WhatsApp message from February from your cousin David? Yeah, I, I have. I have just replied to it as I saw the message. Uh, I'm still 136 WhatsApps deep before I've still not managed to get back to them on my phone. It's really bad, but it's been quite overwhelming at times in terms of the summer with agents and uh, phone calls with other managers and, and sorting stuff out. So. I, I really do apologize. He actually asked for tickets to the Exeter game in March, so I just replied and offered him tickets to the Exeter game in uh, August. So uh, <laughs> delivered. There we go. I've, I've, I've kept through. I mean, it's a bit of a jokey question, but it really does make the point that it is sort of quite insane managing a football club. Yeah, it's, it's opened my eyes. I, you know, you think you're prepared for everything in life, but um, I don't think you can really understand the, in the truest sense of the word how much it affects your life until you're right in it. Um, like I say, I've you, you have to make sacrifices. There's um, family and friends that I haven't seen for for quite a while now but um, yeah, I think when you're in something like this people understand you that are close to you and you have to make sacrifice if you want to be successful at anything. Now one thing I want to cover off before we look at the new change kit for, the, for this season is the atmosphere at Adams Park. Uh, fans have been a little bit disillusioned by the atmosphere especially on the terrace. Uh, there's a working group that met this week at Adams Park as well to kind of start working on that atmosphere uh, and also after the Ring of the Blues live with Rob Keurig uh, uh, sort of a private Twitter group started with Wickham fans uh, and they've gone public now at the 80 1987 WWFC if you want to follow those as well that just to kind of get the fans to do their pre-season work and make sure that when the team come out on the game against Exeter City the atmosphere is as best as it can be and can grow throughout the season Matt how important is that you switch dugouts to be closer to them so you must be a fan yeah it's another thing that again I'm not just trying to change everything but one of the things I, I really enjoyed about my time at Colchester was that I was on the side of the pitch where I was close to the supporters and I really believed that um, one of the things I wanted to do this year was be closer to our supporters and, and help celebrate goals with them and being amongst them. Um, so I've made that decision. Um, I was only, honestly, I was chatting to folks in the office today. We were going over a few tactical bits ahead of the season, and, and he mentioned about us being us and that atmosphere at Adams Park. Um, when we really kind of go high energy, high press, and, and be Wickham, who we know and love. Um, and he mentioned about the atmosphere. We, we know that when the guys get behind us, when we give them something to cheer, it's a reciprocal relationship, and we need to make sure that that's, um, we give them something to cheer this season. And, and when, we, when we're on song and the atmosphere is strong, then, then we know we're a really, you know, really strong contender at home. So, yeah, at the 1887 WWFC, it was on Twitter. Uh, I think they want to hear from as many people as possible because this, you know, this is a, a community club, a, a club rooted in the town. It needs to be connecting with its fans and the fans need to play their part as well. Uh, obviously, the team needs to excite the fans as well. But there will be times across the season, Matt, where you'll need the fans to lift the team as well, right? 
Most certainly so. Um, yeah, most certainly so. We know, we know. You know, I've had some great nights at Adams Park under the lights, or on a Saturday afternoon. It's been some incredible times, and there's been times when we've been down and out, and they've they've roared us on. So we're certainly going to need them. There's going to be uh, hopefully a really fun season ahead. Of course, it's going to be a roller coaster. <coughs> there's going to be you know the odd bump in the road that any season gives you. So we're certainly going to need them, and and we really appreciate all the support they do give us. Well, good. L- looking forward to hearing the terrace from the uh, back of the Frank Adams as well. Just get, to join in. Phil, that's good to hear. And there's there's another question on that's asking basically what the club is doing to market bring more fans in and we're going to continue the stuff that we've done with the way when we have the smaller clubs continue hitting the the school districts and Mm. whatnot but one of the things that can help us more than anything is if our supporters if our season ticket holders the guys that go into games invite your friends your neighbors (laughs) i mean there you everybody who goes to games everybody who loves the chair boys they're the most likely people to bring new fans to the park we can do, we've done it. We go to the schools. We do that. But bring your neighbors, bring your friends, and they'll fall in love with the chair boys just like you did whenever your first match was back way back in there 1889. There's the challenge, guys, and also the fixture posters and, and everything will be ready soon yes. as well. So come down to the shop, and you know it'd be great to get them in all the hairdressers and barbers and chip shops all around the area, of which there are many, just to help spread the word too. Well, I think the time has come to do the most unusual thing I think I've ever done working at this club is, un- is unleashing a kit on the radio. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you're going to be the first to see it. Uh, there's a delightful, very official looking leather black box in front of you chaps. If you could open that and hold that up to the camera, please. And then we'll love to see the new kit. All right. Okay. Oh, here we go. Wow. If you listen on the radio, I can tell you it's beautiful. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> first year in the Football League. Right. This is a, a replica of the shirt that Wickham first wore away at Carlisle in their first ever Football League game. Uh, they, got, they won the double uh, 30 years ago, got into the Football League. The first league fixture was away at Carlisle. Many of you would have made that journey. And Wickham won just because of the colour clash, wore this away kit. And for this season, this is Wickham's change kit. Hummel have done a great job. I think it looks fantastic. And it's been held up now by the gaffer, Matt Bloomfield and Pete Cook. If you listen on the radio, you can see this on the Wickham website uh, straight after. If you're watching on the YouTube feed, stick around when the show finishes because you can see some special stuff that we filmed earlier on with club legend Keith Ryan because Rhino came up today to speak to the players to talk to them about how important it was that Wickham got into the league and how important that journey to Carlisle was. But I spoke to Rhino after that as well and here's what he had to say. Rhino, we've just shown the boys their new change kit for the season, a kit that you know well. Yes, what do you you reckon? It's beautiful, right? Lovely, um, very nostalgic, um, as you say. So that was the kit we wore um, against Carlisle, very first league game that Wickham ever played. So yeah, no, it's lovely. It's lovely to think back about um, that occasion 30 years ago, and it's a cracking kit. Big day in the club's history. Uh, I can't believe it's 30 years, can you? Yeah, yeah. I mean. As we say, time moves on and we're all busy doing what we're doing and obviously I keep an eye on what the lads are doing and we're here at the training ground, been well received by the boys and obviously had the invite from from Matty Bloomfield, the the boss here, so it's been brilliant and uh, yeah, seems a long time ago, doesn't it, but um, almost sort of uh, seems like yesterday equally. You were the perfect choice to show the kit to the boys for the first time because of your connection to it. But one of the things we did, we, we ran the numbers and between you and the gaffer, we reckon a quarter of the club's history has involved both of you at one point. And there was a little crossover, wasn't there? There was, yeah, yeah. We played together for a couple of seasons, I think it was. And yeah, you've aged us there, haven't you, Phil? Really, Sorry. you know. <laughs> um, no, but it's, it's, it's fantastic. You know, I still live locally. Um, I keep an eye on the, on the uh, results. Um, as I say, we're here watching training now. Um, it's a privilege to, to be able to do it. Um, yeah, and as you say, I played my small part in, in the progression of the, of the football club. Let's hope that these guys can take it to where I believe maybe we should be, is, is a, a sustainable championship club. Now tell us about the young Matt Bluefield. He's the manager of this famous club now. Yeah. Back then as a youngster, did you see that maybe that potential as a manager and a coach as well? Well, he always, always had the, the qualities. I mean, there's no surprise that, that Matty came into this football club um, and played over 500 games. Um, and he's um, a student, they to talk of the game, don't they? So always took on information so well. He's a very good guy. He'll relate well to all these players. And yeah, without a question, um, 
yeah, my first meetings uh, with him, he was very impressed. Um, his ability um, on the pitch, you don't stay at a football club for how many, 19 seasons? If you don't have ability, first and foremost, they don't hand out um, contracts to just nice guys. You have to be at a, you know, um, uh, be in the, in, the, in the starting lineup every week. And um, I'm delighted for him that he's back here now. Um, he's Wickham through and through, and I'm sure he'll lead this um, this team with distinction. And here we are watching training as well. A bit different to your day? Not really, no. I mean, obviously <laughs> the surroundings are very nice. There was a few more bobbles on the pitches back then. But yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's the same old thing. There's a bit of a warm-up, which we did. I mean, back in the day, it might have been jogging around and stretching. Now it's, it's a bit more science-based. Always did a passing drill. Um, and then you get into your, your tactical team play. So yeah, nothing much changes. We were talking off the camera a minute ago. There was, you had a little saying, didn't you, about, about the quality of the human beings involved in this club and what we've achieved over those years. Yeah, well, um, I think it was Martin O'Neill's um, saying actually that I read not long ago and I probably won't be able to remember it, but <laughs> he talked about um, superhuman efforts uh, make up um, the character of this football club. So, you know, that's what I felt that we, we gave uh, back all those years ago to achieve what we achieved. I've seen it more recently with this group of, of, of lads, um, the championship um, season when they got promoted into the championship, uh, their endeavours during that season and but for a bit of skullduggery um, we would still be there. Um, all I hope and wish uh, for this team is that they can continue the progress, uh, get that promotion to the to the Champions League, uh, Champions, Championship. Champions League in a few years. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> championship. And uh, and this time sustain that, you know, be yeah. fantastic. I mean, in my lifetime, I'd love to see uh, the progression uh, to stabilise Wickham Wanderers Football Club in the Championship. Why well, not? It's great to have you up here. Enjoy the training. Will do. You got your boots, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great to see club legend Keith Ryan. Uh, incredible, isn't it? A quarter of the club's history is that it had either Keith Ryan or Matt Bloomfield playing. Yeah, that's not bad, is it? <laughs> Thanks. I've heard that a number of times today. It makes me feel old, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is a little bit older than you. Uh, Rob, let's bring you back in as well. The response to the, the first sightings of the change kit, Rob, on, on I'm just seeing the YouTube comments flying by here. People seem to love it, Rob. And they do. And and look, it's a, it's it was a great selection and Pete of course always has his eye on what we're going to wear and he is probably as big a fan of Wickham history as there is out there. Uh, one of the things that he has done so well for us as an ownership group is to come in and get himself so involved in this community and with this club that he understands it better than most. And so when he saw the opportunity uh, to help help us get to this sort of throwback new back um, kit it was great and i gotta say this the the hummel people have been terrific they have produced uh top quality the sales have been good you know me it wouldn't be me just to say it's a great kit without mentioning the sales part uh and so it's, it's fantastic um and, and phil give me give me 30 seconds more to mention wickham sound before i go what a wonderful radio station. What a wonderful partnership. Uh, you mentioned before some new things coming. I have a feeling that the best days of Wickham football and Wickham sound are ahead on both categories and particularly together. So thank you for, for uh, doing what you do. Thanks, Wickham sound. Matty, uh, you and Pete and I can talk about that budget snap boom later. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's on Rigging the Blues Extra. <laughs> that might be quite fruity. I wouldn't mind listening to that. Uh, right, Rob, thank you very much for your time as well. That kit is available to pre-order as well as the new home kit as well. Stick around on the end of this YouTube broadcast. You can see the, the launch when Keith Ryan revealed that kit to the players earlier as well, which was, uh, which was lovely. And features a goal by Matt Bluefield with his left foot, a collector's item, there right? There many. <laughs> uh, we've been inundated by comments and questions as well because this is going to be live throughout the season Matt you must come back and join us right yeah get, get some more questions in we'll come back before the start of the season anything football related that we want to discuss um, I noticed there was loads more questions coming through that we didn't have time to answer so um, yeah I'll come back in the next couple of weeks we'll make sure that we, uh, we answer as many as we can and Pete always great to see you in High Wycombe in person how long are you around for 
Uh, on and off for the next six weeks, for pretty much the next six weeks, yeah. Oh, it's going to be loud, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> There's only one of us. They're in the trouble at Cooling's in town. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the full trouble. They'll be coming soon, no doubt. Well, thank you guys for your time this evening. I know it's incredibly busy. Don't worry. New signings are coming soon, right? Exactly. Watch this space, Very everybody. Soon. Matt Cecil has got the gif in his back pocket for whenever it comes. You'll you'll find out first if you are a subscriber, if you're on the Wickham Wanderers app. All the news will be coming to you very, very soon. Uh, don't forget JJ's testimonial, 29th of July against Cardiff City as well. Come down and show your respect to JJ coming into his 10th season at Wickham Wanderers. Got a bit of time to catch up with the gaffer, but he may get there yet. You never know. Right, enjoy the rest of the summer, guys. There won't as well. be too many testimonials in the future here. Well, we'll Not see. many guys stay 10 years. <laughs> at the same club there we are Pete always gets the last word we'll be back soon on Ringing the Blues thanks for tuning in if you've missed any of the show it's going to be on Listen Again and we'll be back as soon as we can be with news of signings check the socials don't put your phone down and come on you blues Now for me, my first game was in 93 and I went to support a team that had all the values you'd want and all the values that you guys have got as well. The hard work, the spirit, the togetherness, the achieving against all odds. And, and one of the men that really was the forefront of that is here with us today and Phil's going to talk you through his experiences. What's lovely is that Rhino overlaps with the gaffer. So actually Rhino was here up to 2007 and the gaffer obviously joined in 2003. And I think it's always nice when the past meets the present and you've got that opportunity really to learn from someone who's been there and seen and done it, wearing the badge of Wickham Wanderers like you all do, um, brought success to this club. And I know Rhino is really proud to still be amongst it and still be able to come to games and see you boys wearing the shirt with pride. So Phil is going to come to the front with Rhino uh, for a little chat with you. Uh, yeah, Keith Ryan, Wickham legend. So Rhino was one of my heroes. I had a season ticket from 1991 at Wickham Wanderers. And Keith, you joined Wickham in that year, right? 90, 1991, yeah. And Wickham Wanderers were part-time. This summer is 30 years since Wickham Wanderers got into the Football League. The club was amateur. It had been for its entire history up to that point, a famous amateur club. We won the double. We won at Wembley, we won the trophy. We won the trophy in 91 as well, your first season. Mm -hmm. Keith's played at Wembley three times for Wickham Wanderers and won every time. Uh, that team was fantastic. They were my heroes as a kid. It's why I'm here today. It's why I support this club. And this is also Rhino here, scoring one of the most famous goals for our club against Liverpool in the FA Cup semi-final. We were unlucky to lose that day, but Rhino scored the goal. Uh, and I thought we were unlucky not to get an equaliser. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Keith, um, let's play the first clip because Matt mentioned the crossover, which is what I love, because between the gaffer and Rhino, we've got a quarter of our 136 year history is represented by you two. Let's see the clip. Come on, makes you feel old, doesn't it? Jesus Christ, <laughs> killing me. Kill the ki he's killing us. <laughs> this, is, this is 2004, Russian diamonds. Some of you won't heard of Russian diamonds. Autumn comes to the edge of the box to a young man of 14. Who here has seen what <laughs> <laughs> Steve Farage in there as well. Did I actually make make it past the halfway line? <laughs> to celebrate. <laughs> Great strike. Okay, come let's come back, okay, Cynthia. Come back. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go back those 30 years because Wickham were part-time, so I know a lot of you boys have got part-time experience, you know what it's like to play in non-league and stuff, but you had a job, didn't you? I did have a job, yeah. Morning, fellas. So if I reverse back 30 years, is that what we're talking? Yeah, obviously we were a non-league -league team, uh, amateur, trained Tuesdays, Thursdays, uh, and played a game on a Saturday. All good. Um, yeah, it was hard, it was hard work. Um, but there was a common cause. We all wanted to get to a certain point, promotion, uh, league football. So yeah, everything we did during those times uh, was all to try and get us promoted into the league. Easy decision to make once we had to go professional? Uh, well, I was working, 
Um, for your information, I've got a flooring company. It's what I did when I first left school, trained to be a floor layer. So I was working seven days a week, training twice a week. Um, the day we got promoted, decisions had to be made. Um, so I earned probably double the amount in the month before I turned pro than I did when I turned pro. But for me at the age of 23, I think I was, uh, we'd fought pretty hard to get where we got to and it was a no-brainer. Uh, just wanted to put the shirt on, represent the, the team in the Football League. And uh, yeah, um, the opportunity to train full-time for me was uh, yeah, a no-brainer. What were, the, what were the, the cornerstones of success? Martin O'Neill was a manager, double winning team. What was the ethos of that team? Um, we were lucky. We just talked to Rich earlier. We, we, worked with, we both worked with Martin. Um, there was this connection between what he wanted and what the players wanted. Um, we were a young group, a uh, hungry group. We wanted to achieve. Um, he was given an opportunity by this football club you guys have been given an opportunity. I was, Matty was. Lots of people that have come in the door at this football club have gone on to do amazing things. Um, Martin went and, and had a fantastic career. Uh, Matthew's now the, the manager of this club. Um, Russell Martin was given an opportunity here and you've seen what he's done in, in management now. Steve Guppy, a teammate of yours. Steve Guppy went and played um, professional football, uh, top flight football and um, represented England. So yeah, it was a it was a stepping stone, and and I think if, for you guys, if you can use that, um, at whatever age you are, stepping stone in your career to go forward, um, it will be of benefit to you. Um, what did it mean to, to to us? The cornerstones: hard work, determination, never say die attitude. All those things that are instilled have been instilled in you for your career. They're all important. For me, you're successful as you sit here you're, you're successful guys because there's hundreds of thousands of people out there that want to be sat where you are and what did it mean for you as a squad when you won the league in the conference the national league now to then take Wickham into professional football <coughs> into the football league how big a step was that yeah i just think again opportunity you know it, it meant that i could give up working seven days a week it meant that i could concentrate more on my my football i didn't know how far it was going to take well, none of us did. Didn't know how far it was going to take us, but certainly willing to give it a go to see how far we could we could go. Um, yeah, you know, when you're working, um, waking up at five five thirty to to get in a van to go to work, you know, and you're working all day long and it's hard work and graft, and you're not getting back till seven and eight at, eight at night. That's tough, you know. Equally, playing football is tough, you know. But I'd rather be doing this than. Than maybe that. Spoiler alert, it was a really good decision because Wickham got promoted in their first season in the Football <laughs> League in the playoff final. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the fixture list we know can be quite cruel. Mm -hmm. um, who knows where Wickham's first ever Football League game was? <clears throat> Carlisle. Well done. Right. Very good. Let's have a look at what happened on that day. But, you know, optimistically speaking, I'd love to think that we, uh, we could be finishing in the top seven and we have a crack at the playoffs. Well, that's certainly where Mr Knighton expects Carlisle to be after a summer spent adding 13 new players to his wage bill, including Mervyn Day, Carlton Fairweather and Rod Thomas, once a schoolboy prodigy with Watford. Thomas gave Carlisle the lead after 19 minutes. It wasn't the first time Wickham had looked vulnerable, but at that stage, with Carlisle making a special effort to hustle, battle and even intimidate, it wasn't easy. But Wickham kept their cool, and seven minutes before half-time, they scored their first goal in the Football League. It wasn't Chrissy, and it wasn't even a Wickham player who scored it. Chris Curry headed the ball into his own net. But Wickham were worth their equaliser. And for 25 minutes either side of half-time, Michael Knighton and his directors watched in anxious admiration as Wickham's controlled football stretched Carlisle from one side to the other. 15 minutes from the end, Dave Carroll's cross was knocked in by Steve Guppy. But the threat of defeat triggered Carlisle into their strongest spell of the game. And for all Martin O'Neill's animated instructions, his players tired and they were hanging on seven minutes from the end when another set piece was livened up by Thomas's excellent back heel. There we go. 
Carlisle away, you've worked all that time, and the first game in the Football League is the longest away trip you take of the it. season. Take it's it. our last trip of the season as well. Um, you, know, you might have noticed what we were wearing that day. We clashed with Carlisle, so we had a, an away kit. It's 30 years since the Football League. Rhino, this is going to interest you guys. Come and show the boys what's in this box. Okay, <clears throat> so... Um, what are we doing here? So just to commemorate that time, is this the new? This is the this is this season's change kit. Away kit. kit. What you'll be wearing so, on the road. Just a little memory for, from 30 years ago. All right. This is a brilliant replica of that shirt. I had that the original. Unfortunately, it doesn't fit me anymore now. <laughs> um, but that is that is why. So fans of a certain age, probably late 30s onwards, are going to absolutely love this from his, a historical point of view. The younger fans will know the history of it because they'll see this, and you guys will wear this with pride uh, when we go uh, on, the, on the road. We were hoping that Carlisle away was going to be the first game of the season, but <laughs> it wasn't to be. But yeah, what do we think? Yeah, okay. Nice. 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 Yeah, it's cool. it's the wave, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> there we are. Green shorts as well. Very nice. <laughs> yeah, just to finish off, <clears throat> Look, I talk about my time and what you guys have done in more recent years um, has superseded anything that that group of players <laughs> achieved. We're proud of our achievements getting the team into the league. What we need as fans and supporters of the football club is what I know you'll give and with Matthew's gui guidance, a concerted effort to try, who knows where you might end up, but to try and give everything to get to where I believe that we should be. If Bournemouth can be a Premiership team and if Luton Town can be a Premiership team, then I believe that this football club can establish itself in the Championship and I think it's, it's in your capabilities. Okay, there we go. You know, we spoke about last week about our wise boys, right? And linking the past to the present is really important for me because this club stands for Rhino and, and, and the guys that did it then right through the times. And we wouldn't be here having this opportunity if those guys didn't get this club in the league. So we have to be really grateful for that and make sure we cherish it because without that, this wouldn't be happening right now, right? That's why it's important to link our wise of why we're all here, why we're going to do what we're going to do this season, and the group that did that for us to get us here. It's really, really important. So, it's key, brilliant. Thank you for that, mate.